more formal part. Welcome everyone to Wednesday at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work at the University of Wisconsin Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Amy Paulios. She's with UW Health Orthotics and Prosthetics. And she's gonna be talking with us about back on two feet, restoring ambulation with lower limb prosthetics. Amy, I'm about to ask you the five questions I ask everybody. You can answer them or defer or demure as you so fit, see fit. Uh, Amy, where were you born? I was born in Nina, Wisconsin. And where'd you go to high school? Nina High School. Way to go. And then where'd you go for your undergrad and what did you study? I studied biology at Luther College in Decorah, in Decorah? Iowa. Yep. I went to UW Platteville. So we used to hear of all the ads on the Dubuque radio stations of what was happening at Luther. Yep. And then uh, where'd you go for your advanced degrees? Northwestern University. And what is your advanced degree in? Can you tell us a little bit about? Um, well, now degree? you're getting into my talk, Tom. Then let us bridge right that way. <laughs> um, would you please join me in welcoming Amy Paulios to Wednesday Night at the Lab? Amy. Thank you very much. Um, I wish I could see you all in person because this seems like it would be a fun um thing to talk about as a group, and I'm sure there will be some interesting questions at the end. Um, I am going to talk to you a little bit about what I do on a daily basis as a certified prosthetist. Um, I currently work at UW Health Orthotics and Prosthetics. Um, my ridiculously long bi biography, if you read it in the email, um, gives a little bit of my background, but I did an undergrad. Um, I got my undergrad in biology at Luther College in Decorah, Iowa, and um, then went on to grad school at Northwestern University for prosthetics. Um, and when I cut Tom off just a second ago and asking me about uh, my education, um, that's part of what I'll get to in a second when I talk about how somebody gets credentialed to do what I do, because it has changed. Um, I'll go ahead and talk to you quickly about how I got into prosthetics, because that's always a question that people ask me. Um, and it's, uh, it's a fun, fun story to ask almost anybody who does what we do, because everybody's got a story. Um, so when I was a freshman at Luther College, I went into to college feeling like I wanted to do some kind of a healthcare career. Um, I really liked working with people, still do. Um, and I really wanted to, you know, it sounds cliche, but help people. And um, so I, I was sort of honing in on healthcare of some kind, but I didn't know what kind. Um, and I had always loved my optometrist growing up. Um, I thought he had the coolest job and he owned a small business and ran, ran his own show. And, um, so I thought, okay, well, I'll be an optometrist. Like, I like, I like the sound of that. I like the, the, um, example that my optometrist set for me, but when it came down to job shadowing on a day-to-day -day basis during, um, I think I job shadowed like a, a couple of optometry, um, places, during my freshman year or shortly after my freshman year, I just could not um, imagine myself doing the day-to-day -day tasks because it wasn't hands-on enough. It wasn't, um, I wasn't making anything. It wasn't craft craftsmanship enough for me, um, if that makes any sense. I just couldn't maybe get that close to people's faces either and do the lens changes. Is it A or B that you like or C or D better? and day in and day out. So I lost sort of lost interest in that. So I freaked out and went to my academic advisor at Luther College um, named Dr. Marion Kaler, um, still to this day, one of the people I'm most thankful for in mentoring me. 
And I went into, um, so at Luther, it's small liberal arts school. We all had an academic advisor. I'm grateful for that. I went into her and I said, I don't want to do optometry anymore. I'm freaking out. What, what do you think I should do with my life? And I remember distinctly her asking me three very specific questions. One was, well, first she told me to settle down, which was good advice because I was just a freshman and I didn't have to have it all figured out. Um, second, she asked, uh, or first she asked, what did you enjoy doing growing up as a kid? Think about growing up and, and the things you enjoyed. And I said, I, I replied pretty simply that I loved making things. I loved being in my dad's workshop with him, tinkering around with hammers and nails and baking. I, I loved creating little wooden sculptures from little scrap pieces of wood that he had in this workshop. I loved arts and crafts. My mom is a um, retired elementary school teacher. All growing up, she, um, I would get my hands dirty in whatever she was making or creating or designing in her classroom. And so I, I told my professor I liked arts and crafts. I liked making things that that made me happy and I liked helping people. She said, okay, well, what are your best classes right now? And um, I said, well, physics was always a strength and math was always a strength. She said, okay, good. And then what is your favorite science class so far? And I, and I can't remember if this was actually freshman or sophomore year because I know I would only have taken certain prerequisites or whatever, but I immediately answered that my um, favorite class was anatomy class. I love anatomy. I think it's fascinating. I, I, I just think it's just the most interesting subject. So she said, oh, okay, well then you should do orthotics and prosthetics. <laughs> and I said, what is that? Um, and I, I honestly had no idea. So I remember her taking a book off the shelf and making a photocopy of me um, to explain what the career of orthotics was in prosthetics. I think it was specifically orthotics, but as you'll find out shortly, the two are very intertwined. And um, then she said, okay, now go to the alumni office and look up a guy named Doug Sand, who is a, a certified prosthetist that works up in Rochester, Minnesota. And so I did, I looked up this wonderful gentleman named Doug Sand, who is a Luther alum. And he let me come and hang out with him for the day at work, which was at that time called um, Prosthetic Laboratories of Rochester. And I loved it. I, I got to um, go to doctor's appointments with him and then observe what he was doing in treating patients and then go back in the lab and see how they were physically creating these things. So that from there on, it was um, a direct line for me. I had no doubt in my mind that that's what I was going to do. Um, so I made myself useful at, at, at that company, actually, for a, a couple summers during college. I started as a just non-paid volunteer, pouring casts, sweeping floors, and trying not to get in anyone's way. And then I got invited back to work for probably pretty cheap the following summer. Um, I sort of uh, unabashedly invited myself to live with my future in-laws um, for free. <laughs> and uh, I found a home in Rochester so that I could um, work the summer and, and um, work in town for what was at that time called prosthetic laboratories. So then after I was finished with um, my undergrad at Luther, which was biology with a uh, emphasis on all of the classes I knew Northwestern University was looking for, for prosthetics school or for the prosthetics program. Then I worked in Madison for a year for a company that still exists um, called Aljan Company. And I did a lot of fabrication work as a technician, just um, back in the lab fabricating. I learned how to pull plastic. I learned how to um, laminate a prosthetic socket. I got to observe patient fittings I had a very generous couple mentors who would pull me into patient um, appointments and let me help and watch what they were doing. And it was just everything that I saw, I was like a sponge. I tried to learn everything I could from what I was seeing. And I just loved it. And I got very comfortable um, working with my hands, but also working with patients and working with the anatomy that exists that, um, that you, you face various shapes of the body with every patient you meet. 
um, and try to create something for them that they're missing. So that's my story in a nutshell. Um, I'll go through my presentation and would be happy to address um, questions at the end. Tom, I don't know if you can still hear me, but um, I'm just wondering whether in this format, if people jump in, in during the presentation or if I should wait for questions at the end, I'm assuming I should I wait. I think it works better if they can um, wait to the end so that you can have a flow and okay. we'll, uh, they can always type in the chat. Okay. So that they can and you'll, it. you'll maybe tap me or something. Let me know if, if you see a question that I'm, that I'm not seeing. Yes, but um, we'll do the questions at the end if that's okay. Okay. Sure. Sounds Thank great. You. Okay. So that's my little story on how I got into the world of prosthetics. And I'll just go ahead and start with this presentation, which is, I guess, part my story and how I got to what I do part, um, just what is the field of prosthetics look like now? And then, um, a, a little miscellaneous information on amputation and what, what prosthetics and prosthetic care looks like. Um, and I will welcome any and all questions at the end. So let's see if I know how to do this. Okay. So I know what you're all thinking. Prosthetics is a tricky word. And when you introduce yourself as a prosthetist, people's eyes usually get kind of big because they wonder how you're going to finish that word. And so I'm going to teach you all what I'm called. And it is a prosthetist or prosthetist or prosthetist however you want to emphasize it, but the title I hold is a certified prosthetist. If I'm trying to be careful about what that word sounds like, I will sometimes introduce myself as somebody who works with amputees and say that I make artificial limbs for people. But my, my official title is a certified prosthetist. So now that you know what the prosthetist, how it's said and, and what a professional like me um, sounds like, um, I'll tell you that the, what most people are called, not just a certified prosthetist like me, but most credentialed um, professionals in our field are called CPOs, which is a certified prosthetist orthotist. And that is because those two disciplines are intertwined now. Um, and I'll explain why in a second. But when, it's, when I say I'm a certified um, prosthetist, it means that I'm certified by ABC, which is the gold standard for certification in the US. There were previously two ways of being certified for our profession and one has um, basically died now. So ABC is the certifying body. It's a very stringent um, certification that you have to meet certain standards. And it is what is recognized by Medicare and because of Medicare, then a whole host of other things like um, private insurances. I won't get into all that, but basically um, you need to be certified by ABC to provide professional services, not just provide services, but get paid, um, which is moderately important for most people. So back to my, the introduction that I made for myself where I, talked about what I wanted to do and the company that I originally worked for, which was crucial in helping me get to where I am today. Um, Prosthetic Laboratories was a privately owned company based out of Rochester, Minnesota, with some really incredible people that I learned a ton from. And when I moved to Madison, my husband and I moved here because I helped open a branch office for a company called Prosthetic Laboratories which is now um, since 2017, now um, has been obtained, bought by Hanger Clinic Corporation. But this billboard exemplifies what I believe in and why I love my job, because we take the dis out of disability is what we, that was the tagline for this billboard we put up um, back in the day when we were advertising and trying to um, gain referral sources. Um, that's a patient of mine. And, um, she is a perfect example of somebody who has always focused on what she can do instead of what she is unable to. So that, that kind of sets the stage for what we do and why, and why we're so passionate about it. So my normal work day um, is a little crazy at times, which is why I'm still at work giving this presentation. Um, uh, that's a long story too, but 
my work day mostly entails direct patient care. Um, I saw five different amputee patients today, two of whom were bilateral amputees. So they were missing both legs. Um, I fill the in-between patient care appointments with cast work. I'll get to that in a minute. Documentation naturally, because it's medicine and that's part of the job. Um, making phone calls to patients, emails to patients. I do a lot of ordering of components, um, which I did today. I ordered some feet and some knees and some prosthetic socks. Um, and I filled some stock on some soft goods, such as sh compression shrinkers. I'll talk about that in a minute. I do a fair bit of teaching. Um, I guess that's maybe what I'm doing now, but I also um, have the pleasure of being, um, we have prosthetic residents and orthotics residents at UW because of course we're a teaching entity. So we're um, always trying to lend a hand by teaching the next um, upcoming folks who are gonna be taking our spot someday. So we have residents in this field. And then um, I drive <laughs> because I drive between the Middleton office that I'm currently sitting in and the Eastside Hospital or East Madison Hospital, formerly known as the American Center. I run downtown to the main hospital moderately often, and I drive down the street to the Middleton Rehab Building. Um, so I'm at a variety of locations. And then I do a little bit of um, bioengineering work. That's what the picture is of um, one of my lovely patients who participated in a bioengineering study. We're doing another one right now. Um, so I'm involved with that. That's fun. Um, I do a little bit of assistance with research if, it, if they need um, candidates for these studies and I try to assist with that. And then my exam team work that I do that I was just speaking to earlier to Tom about, I just got back from Tampa because I, I volunteer for the ABC certifying bodies um, team of examiners. And we, we administer the exams that um, candidates have to take um, post-education, post-residency prior to being able to ind independently provide patient care in our field. So we're giving a one-on-one -on -one proctored exam to candidates in Tampa. And I just got back um, this weekend from Tampa. So that's volunteer work and it's, it's, um, it gives me a lot of, um, it makes my brain work and it's really gratifying to see who's coming up. So let me make sure I'm doing this right. So ABC certification, as I said before, which is what I have, um, it's considered the, the leaders in the profession and you're expected to provide the highest quality of patient care, um, excellence in research and device design. But there are many certifications that ABC credentials, including certified orthotists and prosthetists. So, so orthotists, um, that's a well-known um, profession that's coupled with ours, including in my office. Those are folks that are working with various parts of the body that need um, bracing, essentially. That's the simplest way of saying it, or it needs correction of some kind to help the body anatomically function in its, in its um, best way. So they're doing bracing, um, such as if a, if a patient has a stroke and has developed foot drop, um, an orthosis can fix that, can it help the patient lift their foot up. We do a lot of um, spinal correction through a spinal orthoses. We do cranial remolding helmets for babies that have flat, um, flattened skulls in many, um, for many different reasons. But orthotics has a, a ton of uh, pathologies, whereas prosthetics, where we're replacing what's missing, has a lot fewer pathologies. Um, and that's, that's one, just one little taste of, of the difference between the two, but they work hand in hand very closely. Pedorthists are foot specialists. So many, many of you that are listening probably have foot orthotics in your shoes that the pedorthists that I work with are phenomenal. They, um, can make the hardest, most difficult foot feel better. Um, and they treat very tough to fit patients with custom shoes or diabetic foot orthotics that are helping me not have to see that patient someday if, if their wound were to get worse and they were to undergo an amputation. So that's, those are certified pedorthists. And then ABC also um, certifies orthotics fitters and mastectomy fitters and therapeutic shoe fitters. 
They don't work completely independently from a um, certified prosthetist, orthodist, but can do almost everything the credentialed clinician can. And then assistance, that's exactly what it sounds. And then the certified orthotic and prosthetic technicians are the ones doing the fabrication work. And we cannot do what we do without them doing the physical fabrication. I still do some fabrication um, on a day-to-day -day basis, but I don't do a majority of the fabrication of the devices that I, that I help fit. Um, and I'll explain what, what I mean in a minute. The American Board for Certification um, website is really fun to look at if you're interested. I did include the link to this as well as NCOPE, which is our educational body um, in the original email about this talk because a lot of people ask, well, how, how do I find out more about orthotics and prosthetics? Or how do, I, how do I tell my granddaughter that this would be a cool field to get into? And, and can you tell me where to go? And COPE is, this is the website where you would find out about the um, education part of things and how to get on the road to becoming a certified clinician or technician or pedorthist or fitter or assistant. So um, speaking of certification and education, people always ask, well, where do you go to school for something like this? And I'm sorry, this is probably somewhat small on your screens, but these are the current ONP programs in the US as of this year. Um, there aren't a ton, but there are many more than there were when I went to school at Northwestern. Um, I chose Northwestern because I could get there um, in two and a half hours from home and I could ride the train there. <laughs> Um, and it was really fun to live in downtown Chicago. It's the downtown campus, not Evanston. So I was um, downtown Chicago for um, a year doing my certification. Oh, and speaking of certification, um, back to the, the, the list of credentialed um, certifies, certifies. Uh, when I say that I am unique because I do just prosthetics. That is a true statement because whereas Tom asked me before, what, where did I go to my um, graduate school? When I went to Northwestern, you could choose one or both disciplines. You could choose to do just prosthetics or just orthotics or both. You can no longer choose. It is a dual certification and it is a master's degree in both. I have what's called a medical certificate degree in prosthetics. Um, so it was like a advanced short and sweet medical certificate in prosthetics. And now if I were to go to school for my job, I would be um, receiving, or I would be earning a master's degree in orthotics and prosthetics, and then choose to sit for one or both exams at the end of my training. So the, these schools all offer master's certification or master's level degree training or um, education programs in orthotics and prosthetics. And they're pretty spread out. Um, and I've heard excellent things about every single one of these. Um, part of the fun of being in Tampa and administering the certification exam is that I get to chit chat with the candidates and ask them where they went to school, where they did their residency, et cetera. Um, and I've, and there's a lot of great schools to choose from now. So, and the, na the name of my talk was back on two feet in the, in the brief description, I talked about the fact that, or I tried to describe the fact that you all might not realize just how many amputees are living among us. And I, I know that that's true for almost everybody I talk to. And my world is obviously, I'm so familiar with amputees of every size and shape, but um, most people don't realize just how many people are living with limb loss. And this is a slide to, hi to um, help highlight that. Um, the limb loss statistics are pretty, have pretty much stayed steady um, as far as causes of amputation, and I'll show you that in the next slide, but um, about 500 people a day nowadays in the U.S. are going to lose a limb, um, or 500 amputation surgeries are done per day nationwide in our country, which is, I'm guessing, higher than most of you probably realize, 
Um, my non-scientific number of for somebody who's been um, certified in working in prosth prosthetics in Madison for, let's see, I've been working here since 2005. Um, I would say on average, I would guess that between the three hospitals, we probably do between one and five amputations per day in Dane County. Um, and when I said five hospitals, I mean uh, systems within Madison. But then if you think about the, uh, the greater Dane County area um, or the surrounding counties, I, I think it's safe to say there's probably at least one amputation done per day um, or two or three. And, and we see many, many of those at UW, within the UW system. So it's more people than you realize undergoing amputation surgery. And here's why people lose limbs. As you might imagine, um, vascular disease accounts for a, a great, great majority of these, um, mostly because of diabetes, because of diabetic neuropathy, because a wound that seemed like a small problem can turn into a really big, bad problem rather quickly. And the comorbidities that exists in patients with diabetes are pretty brutal and limb loss can occur rather quickly. Um, vascular disease without diabetes is obviously uh, another big chunk. If, if um, somebody has poor plumbing, as we say, or just was born unfortunately with poor blood flow for whatever reason, um, previous smokers, existing smokers who have, who have vascular disease without diabetes account for a, a, a piece of the pie. And then trauma um, and cancer survivors. Um, I would say that in my experience as a prosthetist in Madison, my patient population might actually be a little bit higher in the trauma and the cancer sector. And um, there's a lot of little um, portion that this doesn't show as clearly, which is congenital. Um, absence of limb. Um, just for example, the, the of the five patients I saw today, one of my bilateral amputees today was um, is a congenital um, patient. So she was born without her um, without standard and anatomical shape of feet and hands. So my patient population, because I work in um, the UW system, I probably see more trauma survivors because of our level one trauma center, cancer survivors because of the UW system treating cancer here, and um, congenital because of the um, children's hospital. If, if I were to work in, say, Stevens Point or Viroqua or... Um, superior. I think the chart that you see in front of you would be probably more accurate as far as um, true numbers of reasons for amputation. So what, what does amputation lead to for lower limb prosthetic care? This is just delving into a little bit of detail about what timeframes look like for new amputees. And again, I'm speaking to specifically lower limb amputees who lose a limb because of one of these reasons. One, so the first six to eight weeks after amputation, somebody is simply being treated in this acute care phase where we're looking at protection of the limb and trying to just simply get them healed. After they're well healed, then they move into what we call their preparatory or their temporary prosthesis for their first several months to a year. And then they're followed, we follow that up with what we call a definitive or permanent prosthesis. And that's the device we expect them to have for a substantial amount of time. But even though it's called a definitive prosthesis, that doesn't mean that's the only <laughs> prosthesis they're gonna get. And then once we move on from what we call their definitive or permanent prosthesis, then we can talk about um, some fun things like a running leg or a shower prosthesis or something specific to what their job needs are or um, recreational needs. And as you might imagine, that gets into a whole conversation about insurance coverage or lack thereof. Um, I'll just cut to the chase and say, 
when we provide prosthetic care for a patient, it's almost always based on medical necessity. Um, if it's going to be something covered by an insurance company or Medicare, it's all based on medical necessity. So as you can imagine, a prosthesis for water skiing is not medically necessary. So it's not something that's gonna be covered by insurance, but that would be a whole separate talk. And it might make me a little grouchy to talk about. So I'll just keep on the subject. So in the post-operative acute care phase, what we're doing is we're mostly looking at protection of that limb, of course. We're trying to reduce edema or swelling in the limb. We're protecting that incision and we're maintaining somebody's activity level while preventing contractures. So we're trying to maintain proper positioning, making sure the patient understands what's going on with them and how important it is to do these various activities so that they can come out of it and be active and be successful. Um, so we're heavily involved with our physical therapy friends who are absolutely vital in the management of our amputee population. Um, so we're managing edema, protecting the limb, and there's many ways to do this, but we're trying to keep that patient moving around, um, which speaks to why it's important to protect the limb after surgery, because we don't want them just sitting there. Um, so one way we can fuck, um, facilitate functional independence is by what we call an immediate post-operative prosthesis or an IPOP. This is um, something that isn't super commonly done here in Madison, but these are all pictures of ones that I've made here. Um, we have certain surgeons who prefer to go this route. An immediate post-operative post prosthesis is a very aggressive practice in the sense that I'm going into the operating room. That's me. That th those are my hands on the upper left. I'm going to going into the operating room on the day of the actual amputation surgery and applying a rigid plaster cast to the residual limb as the patient is still under anesthesia after amputation. And the reason that this is done is so that the patient can then stand up as the gentleman on the right is and start to very, very light um, toe touch um, walk on day one after surgery. If you're thinking this is crazy and aggressive, it's because it is, and it's not appropriate for everybody. There aren't that many candidates that, um, can tolerate this or, um, surgeons that believe that this is a truly advantageous thing for patients. Um, I think it is for some, uh, it has a huge psychological benefit when you make you know, not make somebody, but allow somebody to stand up and move the day after amputation. It helps them be convinced that they are going to continue moving and they are going to walk again. Um, this is made with a layer of layers and layers of padding and weight bearing in certain areas of the limb that can tolerate it. So um, as you might imagine, this is not something that somebody with diabetic neuropathy who has very poor sensation in their limb can tolerate. And it would be dangerous to put um, a cast on somebody who has an insensate limb. So this is chosen for people who have good pain, you know, good cognition, can understand the directions, can give good feedback. And this cast stays on for about a week, week to 10 days, gets taken off so the limb can be evaluated and then another one can be put on so the patient can keep basically moving from the day after surgery up until right until they get fitted with their prosthesis. Depending on the surgeon's um, practices in each um, medical facility, some places do these a lot, like where I um, was educated and trained um, early on in Rochester, they do a lot of immediate post-operative prostheses there. If one of these isn't done, somebody's put into a compression sock and a rigid um, cast is made. So this is what we call uh, shrinker socks or compression of the residual limb. And this is just a little, little uh, example of how that is really safely and, and carefully applied, how we can, can apply a compression garment to the limb. And this is what one looks like for an above the knee or transfemoral amputation. So there are compression garments for all new amputation levels that will help reduce edema, usually makes the patient more comfortable when they're under compression and starts aiding in that healing process right away. So when, when I go back to what are we doing post-operatively, it's all about protection of the limb and helping the patient to heal. That phase can take anywhere from 
I would say five weeks at a very minimum to 12 to 14 to 16 weeks on the higher end. But we generally don't start fitting the first prosthesis until at least 10 weeks post-operative. Um, most of the time, it's more like 12 weeks. And um, the reason for that is because there's a significant change in limb volume contour and stability after 10 weeks or 12 weeks, especially with our diabetic or dysvascular population. It just takes um, those patients longer to heal. And we cannot do anybody any favors if we try to rush and put them into a prosthesis too soon. So we're waiting for that limb to fully heal. And then we're talking about, well, what is it? What, what kind of prosthesis should we make for this person? That is my, not my decision. I have to follow a prescription, but the lovely thing about working somewhere like UW is I get to be part of the team that does help decide um, what the prosthesis is, is going to look like and what it's going to um, what it's going to act like or what the patient's going to be able to do. But bottom line is the patient it's, has to have a prescription for this device written by an MD or an um, APP, so nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, or MD or DO. And at um, UW Health, we have a wonderful team called an amputee clinic, um, which includes a physical medicine and rehab physician, prosthetics, um, is uh, prosthetist is there, physical uh, therapy is there, nursing is there, social work is there. And um, we do a very multidisciplinary look at everybody's um, needs and try to make sure that they're getting exactly what they need. How is that decided? We look at, well, what did, what did this person do prior to losing their limb? Um, as you might imagine, some people say, well, I want to run with my prosthesis. And, you, and when you ask them how long it's been since they ran, if they say 14 years, you're not likely to be able to help them run with a prosthesis. Um, but if somebody was very active um, prior to perhaps a traumatic injury, um, then that justifies making them something high level. So we look at their current, their previous and current function or, you know, pr previous meaning right before whatever injury occurred or their current stat status as an amputee, their comorbidities, what do they have going on? Do they have any heart conditions? Do they have poor eyesight? Do they have troubles with hand dexterity? What is gonna influence their ability to be successful or limit their ability to be successful with a prosthesis? And do they want to do it? I mean, we've had, um, we've had patients present as a pretty willing candidate um, and that is fantastic. We've also had patients who have very little desire to proceed with um, prosthetic fitting, but you can't do it for them. They have to want to use this device. And, and that comes, that's where the teaching component comes in because we have to help the patients understand exactly what it takes to be successful with a prosthesis and what life is like. Um, and there's a lot of various ways to do that. Um, when I meet with patients, preoperatively or right after surgery, one of the very first things I try to do is connect them to the Amputee Coalition, which is a wonderful nonprofit organization um, which offers peer support, um, meaning they can call a 1-800 number and talk to somebody who, who wears a prosthesis. I also try to do that on a local level because we've had a wonderful, wonderful um, handful of patients go through peer visitor training through the amputee coalition, and they're willing to actually physically go to the hospital and meet new amputees or talk by phone with those um, folks that are going through it. And there's nothing better than that. Um, I, I never ever say to a new amputee that I understand what they're going through because I have both of them. I have all four of my limbs and I have my two feet and as many prostheses as I've made, which is in the hundreds, um, I don't ever want to say that I understand what they're going through because I can't truly, but another amputee can. So I try to connect them with somebody who's been through it. <laughs> and then we, we have to talk quickly about, we don't have to, but I'm going to talk to you quickly about this thing called K levels, which is, um, it's a Medicare classification for 
um, ambulation potential. And just for anybody curious, this is what they look like. So when we talk about what we're allowed to prescribe to a, a new amputee, this is, they have to be categorized in one of these levels uh, for their potential cadence. So if somebody is definitely not able to stand up and transfer safely without assist, with or without assistance, there's no way a prosthesis is going to enhance their quality of life or mobility, mobility. So they would be a K level zero and not a candidate for a prosthesis. But if they have a, a level one, that would mean they can stand up and maybe pivot transfer. Perhaps somebody just wants to pivot from their wheelchair to their bed or wheelchair to the toilet, walk a couple of steps across the room. Um, that is the um, level one. Level two means that they have the ability to do all those things independently and they can get around their home, usually at a single speed. Level three means the patient can walk at variable cadence or various speeds and they can transverse um, environmental barriers such as curbs on the street or grass or go up and down a ramp in and out of an office building or church or um, things like that. And then level four are our extremely active patients um, such as runners, little kids, um, or um, sometimes people that work in um, very demanding physical jobs like farmers, um, um, maybe gym, somebody, somebody in a really physical fitness job, like a, a gym or a personal trainer, maybe a police officer who has to be, have the ability to run. So those level K level categorizations dictate what components um, the prosthetist is allowed to fit to a patient. I can't just blindly say somebody is going to be a K level three if I have no proof of that or they have no desire for that. So hopefully that makes sense. So Amy, what, how do you make a prosthesis? What goes into, what goes into providing a prosthesis? Well, here's a simple list, though I would argue there are probably even more factors than this, but First thing that happens is that we evaluate the patient. We do an intake and get to know that patient, understand what it is that they've got going on medically, physically, um, emotionally. Their insurance is obviously a factor. We have to make sure that the um, patient understands what the insurance dictates they'll pay for or not cover. Um, we take a cast. In my, um, in my world, I take plaster molds of, of patient's residual limbs. I actually take a whole bunch of measurements, um, the anterior, posterior, medial lateral dimensions, length, circumferences. And then I take a plaster model, almost always plaster is what I use, plaster bandage or um, fiberglass soft cast to actually take a physical mold of the residual limb. Once in a great while, I'll take a, an impression where I submerge the residual limb into a goopy mixture, like what they do at the dentist with you. If you've ever had impressions taken of your teeth, once in a great while, I'll do that for somebody's residual limb. Most of the time I'm taking a plaster, um, a fabric, um, plaster model. Then I will fill that plaster model with um, plaster Paris and make a positive model. And I will sculpt that to help change the, the dimensions of that positive model so that when I create a prosthesis to fit on a body part, I'm compressing areas that can tolerate it and I'm relieving parts that can't. Then what we, then we make what's called a test socket. And I'll show you pictures of this in a minute, but a test socket is a clear diagnostic socket. It's sort of crudely assembled, but it's very adjustable and it's a practice. It's for practice fitting. And that's what a test socket is. Then we um, actually fabricate the final prosthesis, which is what the picture is on the right. That's called the lamination. So somebody's um, plaster model is upside down in a jig and they're filtering in laminate liquid into layers of fabric. And they're making the walls of a prosthetic socket that's gonna fit onto somebody's leg. And that will make more sense in a minute when I show you some other pictures. So then after the device is physically made, we fit it on the patient, we have them stand up. I align where the foot, perhaps the knee, if they're above the knee amputation, where all those pieces and parts have to go to, to work correctly. And then we fabricate the finished prosthesis, which is usually means it's going from 
one stage to a final ready to send out the door phase, then we um, deliver the prosthesis and set that patient up for physical therapy and to learn how to use that device. And then very, very last is the cosmetic cover. And the reason that's last is because, um, as you might imagine, most of the time patients' um, capabilities for activity is a much more um, heavy concern than their cosmetic uh, wishes, but the cosmesis is the very, very last thing we worry about because we're worrying about the biomechanics of what we're doing in the ambulation of the patient before we make things pretty for them. Um, before I go on from this list, I just want to mention quick, when people um, allude to how costly prosthetics are, prosthetic limbs are, I, I think it's worth mentioning that every single thing that I just told you in that list of providing a prosthesis is all lumped into the cost of the device. And the reason that I think that's really important is because it's not a very well understood fact. Um, every minute that I spend doing any one of those things or all the things I didn't list, such as documentation, talking on the phone, running to the hospital, um, discussing with the doctor about the amputation level, visiting, possibly consulting in the OR, none of that time is covered necessarily by the minute or by the hour or by the quarter of an hour. Everything is lumped into the final cost of the prosthesis at delivery. So when somebody literally is gonna physically walk out the door with their finished prosthesis, they sign a delivery slip for said device. And that's when all of that stuff is paid for. We don't get paid by the hour for our time or um, each individual thing. It's all encompassed in that. So it's kind of a it's a kind of unique and perhaps not necessarily fair way of paying for something or or being be, being billed for something or charging for something. That's just the way things in our field work. And um, so I think it's worth mentioning all of that because yes, prosthetics devices prosthetic devices are very expensive. But if you if we do a really good job and we put the time in and every single one of these elements is done correctly, I think it goes a long ways in justifying um, that final cost. Uh, so making a prosthesis, this is just a quick picture that I took because that's at the um, East Madison Hospital the day that, because um, we haven't always had a, a, a fabrication lab for prosthetics specifically within the UW system prosthetics department was added on here in 2017. We've always had an orthotics department, but now we have prosthetics. And this cast work that I'm doing in this picture happened to be the very first cast I was modifying at that office location. So I felt the need to take a quick picture, but that what I'm doing there on the right is what we call cast work or cast modification. So that model is a positive plaster model of a below the knee or transtibial amputee that came from the cast that I took of somebody's limb that morning, that I filled that positive model that's sitting in the pipe ice in front of me. And I'm probably, I have a cup in my hand, which makes me think I'm probably just at the very end of the work where I'm smoothing out the plaster mold. And then from that point, it would get made into what we call a check socket. Um, real quickly, the photo on the left is of me palpating the residual limb of a little girl who's um, who was born with uh, severe, severe club feet. And so those dots I've made on her limb were simply anatomical um, locations of circumferences I had to take to record the dimensions of her limb. So then from the picture on the right or the cast modification stage, we go into what's called check socket fittings. So this model is taken back into the lab and a, usually a flat sheet of plastic is heated up in the oven and vacuum formed around that model to then make a negative impression of the model, which is called the socket. And the socket is what we fit on the residual limb. And these are all photos of me doing various check socket fittings or diagnostic fittings on different patients. Um, and this, so these are all the very first time these folks are being fitted 
for their prosthesis in their first diagnostic fitting. So it's a clear kind of crude, crudely assembled in appearance, but purposely so because I'm allowed to move the components any which way I want to. The patient on the right um, has two prosthetic limbs, two lower leg amputations. <coughs> Excuse me. The right prosthesis is a transfemoral or an above the knee amputation. And that's my friend, Nicole, who's a physical therapist at UW Health. She is helping the patient understand how to operate the prosthetic knee joint. And that was the first time that person had walked with just um, with both prostheses. She'd been previously fit with just one, um, the left below the knee um, prosthesis. That was her first time standing up with bilateral fittings in the check socket or the diagnostic fitting we're doing is on the right, on, on her right or our left. Um, I included the little picture in the middle where it says 10 months because that is my record for youngest patient fit to date. Um, as you can see, it's a sweet, sweet, sweet little um, tiny baby. And um, she was born without her foot and she is now four years old and is nonstop. She is just, she runs in and gives me a hug. And um, it's, it's just amazing. Kids are, kids are so fun to work with because they don't, um, they don't pause and think about what they're missing. They just go for it and they just move forward. I think um, it, prosthetics care for pediatrics is way harder on the parents than on the kids um, because they, because the parents of course had a different view of what life would probably be like for their kiddo, but the kid just doesn't care. They just, they just go for it and they don't sit and dwell. Um, it's a totally different emotional side of things when somebody's lived part or most of their life and then goes through an amputation. So you can imagine um, there's a lot of emotion that goes into what we do. Um, and I could talk again, I could talk in a whole different um, lecture about that. So I'll move on, but these are check socket fitting. So this is, this is what, this is what we do after the casting and we've created a diagnostic socket. Then from this part goes to what's um, called a laminated or finished device. So this is the progression of that patient that was in the, in the, um, on the left side of the screen here. This is the progression from her first check sock fittings to her first finished prostheses to her second pair of finished prostheses. And then the next slide is um, just last year. So she is, as you can see, she went from walker um, to completely independent. And this actually was a patient that I saw today and she ran in and um, did not stop moving during the entire appointment. It was hard to keep her to sit still, but um, just one of the many amazing patients that I have the, um, the joy of working with. So um, back to the description of sort of the progression of lower limb prosthetics. So when we talk about the, that acute care phase, we then talk about their preparatory or their first prosthesis or prostheses if they're bilateral. The first device only lasts three to six months sometimes. Sometimes it's nine or 12 months, but the point of that first prosthesis is adjustability. The residual limb changes a lot in the first year of somebody's life as an amputee. And it's not um, something that you can expect them to accommodate just by changing their prosthetic socks um, within the socket. We have to adjust, adjust, adjust that prosthesis to keep up with the anatomical changes that take place in the limb. So in that first, sometimes three to six months, sometimes nine months, sometimes 12 months. Those are all, there's no set schedule for anybody in their life as an amputee. So, and that's important to understand because some people want to have a firm time frame of when I'm going to get my first leg or my second leg, or when am I going to get my pretty leg or my permanent leg? Everybody's different. The, the idea is um, you have to give that limb time to mature, to get stronger for the patient to get more active. And then once we've adjusted that um, first prosthesis a ton and sort of are out of options to keep it fitting well and keep the patient comfortable, then it's time to move on to the second one or the definitive prosthesis. 
Um, as you might imagine, just by how I've spoken up to this point, devices are named or prosthetics um, amputation levels are named by where they happen. So you've heard me say um, transtibial or below the knee amputee a lot. Um, that's in, in, in our world, that's called a BK. So if you've ever heard somebody say, I'm a BK amputee, that means below the knee or I'm an AK amputee is above the knee amputee. But if you wanna use the correct terminology, um, we always try to talk specifically about where the amputation happened. So are they a partial foot amputee? Have they had just the forefoot um, removed? Are they um, a signs amputation, which means it's a disarticulation at the ankle. No bones are transected in that surgery. It's, it's a dissection and a reconfiguration. Um, the entire tibia and fibula are left intact in a signs. Transtibial is by far the most prevalent. Those are probably 70% of what most prosthetists see. Um, they're just the most common. Um, knee disarticulations is again, no bone is transected, but it's a disarticulation at the knee joint. Transfemoral is above the knee and then the, you know, on and on. So my point of saying all this is there are various levels. If we're talking about specific levels of amputation, we talk about where it happened. This is by far the most common amputation level, which is below the knee or a transtibial. The reasons for the amputations you can see in this picture um, are patients I've all fit. Um, so for example, the top left is meningitis. The lower left is diabetes. And um, um, that was a patient that lost one limb and then subsequently two years later lost the second. Middle um, gentleman is a car crash survivor. And the patient on the right was a, a four-wheeler injury collision um, that subsequently got infected and was not able to be salvaged. You can see these are all various types of limbs. Um, these are all very familiar to me. If you're wondering why the prosthesis on the right looks so awesome, it's because that's a very carefully finished cosmetic cover. So that's that device um, on that patient is the same sort of structure as somebody you'd see who, who is wearing something where the pipe or the pylon is showing. It's just covered up very nicely after the finished um, fitting with um, foam and then a cosmetic cover or a skin on the outside. Pretty unique. I think it looks pretty great. Um, that patient walked well enough that you would never know that there was, that was a prosthetic limb if you didn't look closely. But that's kind of a, this slide shows a variety of the types of patients that I work with on a, on a very normal basis. And then transfemoral prostheses are the second most common amputation level that somebody like me would see. Um, transfemoral amputations happen, um, again, mostly because of uh, diabetes and diabetic neuropathy or vascular problems where the patient might not be able to heal a below the knee amputation, and therefore the limb has to be amputated higher. I'm sure the two individuals on the left and the right of this are um, probably either cancer survivors or traumatic injuries um, because they're, um, they, don't, uh, they likely wouldn't be in the demographic of um, dysvascular disease. So between transibial and transfemoral prosthetics, that's what I see. That's my bread and butter. That's what I, that I, what I do on a very, very regular basis. Today I had um, the little girl that you saw earlier um, with congenital loss of limb from birth um, of uh, affected hands and feet, but I was replacing her lower limbs. Um, then I had... Um, um, a, a woman who was in a bad car accident and has one below the knee prosthesis and one above the knee prosthesis. I saw a gentleman who has, um, who survived a motorcycle accident and then another diabetic patient. So that's sort of just an example of my average day. Um, and then uh, I know you saw a glimpse of the very last slide, but um, in a smattering of various uh, other things that I get to do. Um, here's one example. <laughs> I did a um, prosthesis for Ferguson, the donkey, 
um, who, so I got a, a call one day, this was like three and a half years ago, probably from the vet school that said, Hey, um, we heard you have prosthetics now. Would you be interested in, in helping us out? And this was a, a pretty fun project um, that I got to help with. And Barry, um, I think that's the probably the cutest donkey I've ever seen. Um, so we helped this. This donkey had been abandoned and had some really terrible um, diseased hooves. And it had what well, they were able to save um, his right for four leg, but not the left. And so I made this prosthetic device basically for like a, a ankle amputation or a ankle disarticulation. Um, this guy was able to still bear weight on the end of his residual limbs. So the prosthesis was moderately straightforward for me to make. Um, but this is my one of three animal prostheses I've created in my career. So just a little bonus. So, um, I'm sure that I talked long enough um, and I'm sure there are probably some interesting questions. So I guess at this point, I'll look at first the chat. Sure. And you're doing great. Uh, um, Lawrence Winkler has a question there in the chat. How often is a new prosthetic required? He's assuming that these things wear out. You bet. Um, you, sir, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, that's it's it's kind of a tricky answer, and I'm I'm gonna try to do my best to to address it. Medicare, um, which is sort of the standard that most prosthetists and orthodontists have to follow, would tell you that prostheses should last three to five years. Um, I think that's a little bit of baloney because I don't have that many patients that actually get a solid three to five years out of every prosthesis they use. Why? Because anat anatomical changes happen. If you think about how many times you buy new pants, for example, or why you have to buy new pants, if you go up or down a pant size um, and you're an amputee, you're going to need a new leg. So weight gain or weight loss is a huge factor. Um, components and or somebody's uh, um, ambulation needs might change. So for example, the patient um, that you saw a picture of where I said I had fit one prosthesis and then she ended up having a second amputation, that would certainly make her needs for how she was going to get around different than she was with one prosthesis and her sound side leg. So if somebody changes uh, ambulation level or activity level, that justify, justifies replacement of a prosthesis no matter what, whether the patient's going to a more active phase or a less active phase. Um, things get worn out. I mean, the gentleman that I saw today, that's a um, car crash survivor, the foot shell, which is the component that covers the carbon fiber foot module had a hole in it. Why? Because he's climbing up on ladders and going up on roofs on um, barn buildings and things like this. I mean, the guy does not slow down. He plays volleyball. So things get worn out and um, talk about a good reason to need to replace stuff. Those are the patients that are wearing things out because they're living life and, and, and that anything that's medically necessary to uh, allow the patient to keep moving is going to be covered by insurance. Um, and all of those reasons give us uh, medical clearance or, or allow us to replace things and get paid for them. Sometimes we have to argue for it a little bit, but um, so yeah, so Medicare, the, the, the easy answer is Medicare says three to five years, but any medical reason for medical necessity or change in anatomy that I have recorded, you know, patient's limb volume changed up or down and we've adjusted this, but they're getting a wound because they're slipping too far into their socket. That's a, a fine reason why a prescription can then be filled for a new device. And then um, if folks, if you want to unmute and ask your question with your voice, that's fine. In the meantime, Sandy's got one there in the chat. I don't know if you can see that, Amy, or not. Has Craig Brubin tested any of your patients in kinesiology? Probably. <laughs> um, a lot of things go on within UW that I'm not aware of. So I apologize. I, I want to know that, actually. So I'm going to look, Sandy. 
Um, that name sounds familiar. Sandy, do you want to chime in and brief? Amy I, I, it would be interesting to see see Greg is he doesn't do any clinician work, but I'd be interested to see your patients uh, testing their gait and how their gait is affected and how that would affect the prosthesis. And I think that uh, Craig would be very informative on that because uh, his device measures in three dimensions, not just the two dimensions like a mat. Uh, he, he gave an excellent Wednesday night at the lab talk. And unfortunately, his, his device was too big to get through the door. <laughs> but he's been at some science uh, uh, alliance uh, uh, thing, uh, uh, events that Tom puts on and people could get on his uh, machine and then uh, it shows all the dimensions of you as a stick figure where all the forces are. So sure. I think it would be really interesting to see your patients, especially the ones that may be struggling a little bit, uh, how they could, uh, uh, Craig could help with that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that, that's my question. Thank you, Sandy. Yeah, to be honest, there there are a lot of things going on within the UW system that I'm not always aware of. And I see that his study um, deals with stroke uh, patients. We see our ortho my orthotics clinician colleagues see a lot of stroke patients. And so I'm sure that there is some overlap in um, the devices they provided for those patients and his work. Other questions? You can either type them in or speak them out. I'm gonna ask, uh, what is the status of 3D scanning um, in your field? Where is it heading? Yeah, you that's a that. fantastic question. So the one and only thing I currently use in regular, um, in, on a regular basis right now that's been 3D printed are those did you see those, the, what we call donning tubes? They looked like PVC plastic tubes that were helping us apply our soft, um, soft compression garments. Those are 3D printed. Um, and the, the fast answer is upper extremity prosthetics and um, diagnostic parts of our jobs have taken off with 3D printing. And as I said earlier, I'm I'm almost entirely focused on lower limbs, so I can't get into specifics about upper extremity. My, the, the office I used to work at and my very good friend, Chad, he had an occupational therapy background. So he would do all the upper extremity prosthetics and I would do lower. So I just never developed a specialty in upper extremity. But as you can imagine, the one limiting factor with 3D printing is the strength of the, of the devices that are being made. They can't quite wait test or weight rate to the strength that somebody needs when they are bearing weight on a prosthesis. So that's why they're so handy for upper extremity because you're not bearing weight on an upper extremity prosthesis. Um, it's getting there. It's just that they, the, the strength of 3D printing has to get better before we can um, feel confident that that structure of the socket on the body is gonna stay together because of how those beads are laid down on top of one another. The way we currently do things, um, like I showed in that picture before, a laminate, it, lamination is made where um, acrylic resin is filtered into and saturates layers of carbon and fiberglass and um, nylon. And that the strength of that weave with acrylic resin in it is what creates the strength of the, of the devices. I mean, I've, I've fit, a young gentleman that was benching or, or like deadlifting, I don't know how many hundreds of pounds, but we can make them really, really strong. Um, 3D printing just isn't there yet. And along those lines, um, not just the in addition to the 3D printing, um, how about the three-dimensional measuring so that you're making yeah. Uh, instead of tape measures and stuff, right. how precise right. can the measurements be? So I will totally admit to you that I am a little bit old school when it comes to how I measure um, because there are younger clinicians that I work with that I love and appreciate that are doing um, scanning rather than um, tape measure dimensions and AP and ML. Um, so there's a, there are several systems being sold now where there's a, a scanner where somebody's limb is physically scanned with an electronic handheld scanner 
and it presents itself on their screen in a model on the screen that the clinician can then manipulate and change and modify to create the prosthesis rather than doing it all by hand. I think um, I would be open to learning that method at some point, but I have a p- passion, I guess, for the hands-on artsy, yeah. artsy part of the sculpting and the plaster work that I um, do. So I just, I would miss it if I didn't do the plaster, um, even though it's messy. I love it. Yeah, I, that's great. I, I see another um, chat question. Do you want me to hit that, Tom? Sure, please. So Dareth um, asked, do prosthetics for the uh, foot, toe, metatarsal articulate other than at the ankle? Fantastic question. Um, Yes and no. (laughs) So there isn't, there is almost never a, a specific articulation at the ankle per se, unless there is a, a multi-axial joint. Most of the feet that are sold now, um, and I don't know if I'm answering the question you, the way you wanted me to, Dareth, but um, for example, a below the knee amputee wears most commonly a carbon fiber foot. That carbon fiber foot is made in such a way that it does not necessarily articulate on an axis, but it articulates in many axes because of the way that it's created. Um, something made for the, for the foot toe metatarsal does not Um, have a mobile joint at the metatarsals like your anatomical foot would that's built into the structure and how it rolls over. If that makes sense, there's not a standalone ankle. It's all complete in one unit and the way that that carbon or the composite materials work. There are some fascinating, um, if anybody is curious about this, um, freedom innovations or or Prodior or Autobach. If you just look for YouTube um, videos on prosthetic feet and how they test them, it's just fascinating what they put them through. So I don't know if I'm answering that super well, but the answer is kind of no. They don't articulate specifically other than that one piece and compass system, mostly at the ankle. Does that sound pretty good, Dareth? Yep. Great. Uh, Sandy's also mentioning Lennon Rogers. Uh, so Lennon works in the College of Engineering. Uh, he's a electrical engineering PhD from MIT. Uh, he builds electric motorcycles and he also does amazing things with uh, 3D scanning, 3D printing. Uh, so that's another place that you could go check out. Oh, excuse me, mechanical engineering instead of electrical engineering for uh, Lennon. Uh, so Sandy's just suggesting him as another place that, plus he, he runs the, uh, oh, what do you call it? The DIY place on campus. So he's he's got toys. And since you've mentioned oh, how you love building stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> boy, if you ever need a well tricked out, uh shop he's got he and his That's colleagues have again. two one in the uh engineering centers building and the other um in the old engineering library building uh, um tom before i i don't want to get cut off i just got a blink on my computer saying i'm running low on battery so okay. i would hate i would hate to get cut off i probably have 10 percent left but okay uh thank you for the warning um, you mentioned upper limbs. Can you tell us more about, um, what your colleagues have to do when you, you're making an artificial hand that has to be able to grasp and release, or is that different? Is that a different area than what you totally do? Totally different area. So, um, long story short, what you're referring to is what we call myoelectrics and, um, electrodes based inside the socket, um, that read muscle impulses. So if I'm doing an example, if I do flexion or extension and those electrodes were placed on my extensors or my flexors, those electrodes placed in the socket generate 
the message to the electronic hand to do what they want it to do, whether it's grasp or open or close or rotate. Um, that's the basis of myoelectric prosthetic hand control. Although that's going in a really exciting direction now where they're working at, um, um, they're doing amazing things with neural interfaces yeah. and actually connecting. Um, I know Sam Poor is involved in neural interfaces with getting connected essentially to help the brain to be able to tell their muscle that's remaining what to do, which would then talk to the um, prosthetic terminal device or the hand um, to tell it what to do. And it's going in a really exciting direction right now. That's outstanding. Other questions? If not, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. It's a gorgeous night out there. You can still go out and get some of the gloaming and uh, enjoy everything. Amy, thank you very much for yeah really eye-opening talk for me. Um, I, I'm looking forward to inviting you to give a similar talk to the Wisconsin 4-H folks because you do such a great job of talking about how you got interested in this, the training, um, the fact that you're now professionally, you're part of the folks that test people and all this. It's a, a tremendous range of experience that you bring and share. Uh, one of the most important questions are, am I having a virtual beer? I always have a virtual beer. Unfortunately, I'm in isolation, so I'm having an isolated virtual beer. So this question Amy is getting at, the, we usually go out to, afterwards to the library, which is a little bar there. Right, the I, I know, library. I know the library. Well, thank goodness, yes. <laughs> um, so uh, we took Dan last week, and we can't go this week, but uh, if you come back another time, we'll see if we can get a real, real beer. Sounds good. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the invite. It was wonderful. Appreciate it. All right. Take care, Tom, and everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Amy. Bye.